This is episode 73 of the Gauntlet Podcast. My name is Jason. I'm Lowell. I'm Andrea. And I'm Rich. Awesome. So we finished up our three sessions of Legacy, Life Among the Ruins. Uh, Let's talk about that a little bit. Let's do a little follow-up. So Lowell, what are your follow-up thoughts on Legacy after having finished the, the, the full scheduled sessions? Well, as I had said last time, I was very uncertain if I was kind of running it at the, the right level. And when we got to this session, I tried to pull back a little bit. And, and I said that consciously to the group and tried to make things maybe a little more abstract. And I'm not sure that was successful. I think it maybe even more illustrated kind of a, a discrepancy between the family playbook side and the personal playbook side. And... It's really too bad. One of the great things is that idea about the the family and playing that out. But I ended up having a lot of individual scenes as a result of that. And then at the end, when we talked, people said, oh, well, the, the scenes where we had multiple people together were better. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's fair. I think that's a fair uh, assessment of that. So when we first came into that that session and I started the the, the group together in one place, one of the things we said at the end of that session was, oh, I thought we might start apart and do our individual things, which I think maybe would have been better for the system. But again, we would have had that problem of people playing individual scenes and not together. So I'm not sure what to make of it. I was I was happy where we got to the end. I thought it, I brought the threads together. I felt like, like things were complete and I was happy with that. And... So, so I'm really I'm really uncertain about that. Rich, Jason? Yeah, yeah. I I'll just say like sort of big picture, like bird's eye view of the whole three sessions, which was a lot of it was was setting the game up. Um so we yeah. it was really only kind of like two sessions of play and kind of barely that. But kind of big picture, I think after playing those sessions, I have a I have definitely left the game with a better handle on the moves and a better sense of what the game is trying to do, but I'm th- I think I'm still in the same place of there needs to be a more of a structured way of how you're supposed to play out those two like you know levels of play, like how you're supposed to do it, and you know something like Night Witches I think would be great. Yeah. Something like Undying would be really really good. Um, mm. Undying does like that like zoomed out time you know it has like a whole separate set of moves for like accounting for the passage of time and that seems like a great way to use those family moves yeah yeah rich what do you think there were moments where i was having a good time but i realized that that was um not because of the system so I, yeah i i just never knew where i was yeah. supposed to be playing i, I kind of walked away from my family early on and that seemed more comfortable for me but then i realized i was leaving some moves on the table Here, here's the thing is we could have done that game in terms of the actual play at the table almost without any of the family moves and and i think that's that's maybe a problem on my my side and i really would like to see how illis runs it because i'm I know there's a game there, and I do want to say that he's responded to some of the the, the comments in the most gracious fashion. Yes, <laughs> I will. I will second that. I was yeah, very, really very cool. pleased by that, that. Yeah, that is the way that game designers need to respond. Even if you disagree, you you thank them. Just just really gracious. Yeah, I um I was really happy that he was, you know, when we posted up the last episode, he jumped in there and he kind of gave us, you know, he he kind of acknowledged some of the things that we were saying and tried to, you know, show, you know, he I think he tried to give some examples of how he thought it was going to go and everything. Yeah, very very gracious like constructive response, right? Which yeah. I thought was really good because we've definitely had some people where we've like said the most like benign of critical things about a game and we never hear from that person again, right? Like that like that game designer drops off the face of the gauntlet earth and you know, it's just uh I don't know. It's kind of yeah. a tricky thing about doing the show, I guess, but um because here's the thing. You know, we choose to play these games, right? Like we were all very interested in legacy. And I think like, I think the reason why we're having this discussion is because, you know, I, for my speaking for myself, and I think I'm sure the two of you will agree. I think there's something really awesome there. Like you said, Lowell, there's a game here, right? And I would love to see like the revised edition. I'd love to see where it goes. Absolutely. Absolutely. The idea is great. 
I think there's some wonderful ideas about the the family versus character playbooks. Uh, I I and I I really want to see that. Um, you know, it's given me a lot of ideas on how I might do a purely family level game, and I've been working on that after doing that. And it's it's I would say if you like PBTA designs and you're interested in that topic at all, it's something worth picking up. And to give context to my commentary about I walked away from the family move, that's probably like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'll be honest, when I play a game, I'm much more comfortable kind of dropping behind the eyes of my character and moving between the levels, you know, the breaking of flow, like in Kingdom and the like. <laughs> that's not my, that's not my preferred play style. And so Legacy probably was not a game meant for me. So any of the feedback that I have is probably taken with a grain of salt, honestly. Well, you know, I'm glad we did it. Yeah. It was, you know, I think I think there's something there and I'd love to see if James decides to do something else with the game. I would I'd love to see where it goes because I think that there's, you know, Lowell and I've been talking about this for a little while now. I think there's room for some sort of like zoomed out like uh, noble house, noble family building sort of like PBTA game. I don't know if that makes any sense, but mm-hmm. um I think there's room for something like that. And I, and that's why I thought this was going to be like that. I thought it was gonna be something like along those lines, but anyway, do you have anything else you want to say about it? Lowell? No, I think, I think we covered it. I, I, I would recommend people check it out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's on sale right now, right? Or is yes. that one of the ones that's on sale or is uh, yes, it? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It is. Okay, cool. Awesome. So as of the day of this recording, um, yeah, <laughs> who knows I, if it will be by the I time I can't find the sale page, but I know there are a bunch of PBTA games that are so, currently yeah, on sale yeah. as of this recording. And I yeah. hope that it's still on when this, goes live because there's some really really good deals cool cool andrea what is godbound godbound it's an osr style game i'm not really sure of the background i kind of jumped in like two hours late because telling time is hard um (laughs) but you play characters that have basically seized the powers of the gods and i don't know if the gods are dead or just not there or what is going on with them but so you play these characters that have god powers and it's really cool how they incorporate it because everyone has three guide words that are supposed to kind of tell you what your character is about and then you can basically use those as the driving forces behind your character and they also give you neat little things too and then you get little gifts and i had a really fun time with this game because it was supposed to be a one shot so we just went in with like god powers blazing you know (laughs) We had someone like floating around in a dark cloud. We had someone like turn completely gold as blinding as the sun. And he had a little whip he was whipping people with. And it was just absolutely (laughs) fantastic. And it's it like, it sounds really interesting for like longer term campaign play, but just the way we played it was just absolutely perfect to me. Cause I've never really played that. Like, look at me, I'm a God and watch me do God things. So it was really fun. Awesome. Mm Mm-hmm. My character had three different guide words, and one of mine was luck, which was the best thing ever, because basically I use luck as a weapon against my enemies. So I got to come up with all sorts of like, oh, by happenstance, this boulder falls off a cliff and crushes this guy. Oh, (laughs) the bad guy hit this platform too hard, and now the big bad has dropped to her death. Oops, just bad luck, right? (laughs) Right, yeah. Uh, And that kind of feeds into, apparently, the goal of the game is to form this kind of cult. And you and the other PCs become the pantheon of this world, which is really cool and really meta and really kind of zooms out a lot more than most role-playing games, where you just sort of, you're just kind of there doing your thing. Even in D&D, like, even if you hit, like, level 20, you're supposed to be epic level, but I don't know. Most of the games I've played, it doesn't really feel that way. It just gets harder. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so like for this cult building aspect, is there like a mechanical implication there? Or like, how does that work? I'm not actually 100% entirely sure because it was a one shot. I think I won because the other characters were bickering (laughs) about who should get these soldiers we recruited. And while they were bickering about whether they should just bow down or worship one character or if, you know, freedom of choice was important. I just kind of swooned up and I'm like, so you're going to join my crew. (laughs) I think I won. Nice. Awesome. Um, the kind of difficult thing about, at least like the way my character was built, my character was a pirate, so she was all about deception, and I had the luck thing going for me. So it didn't look like I was actually doing anything when I was actually doing all this other stuff. And so building a cult off of that 
I feel like would be really difficult. And we actually kind of talked about it a little bit after game, which is why I know this is a thing. The other characters, I mean, were very obviously like glowing and dark clouds and lightning bolts. And there's one guy that like buried a peasant under like a whole bunch of coins just because he could. Just ridiculous <laughs> things like that. But mine were was so it, Was it like a monkey's paw thing? Like, do yeah. they wish to be rich or yeah. something? Like <laughs> They were like, give, give us all your money. And he's like, okay. <laughs> so that mechanic, I feel like, might get a little bit squidgy in play. You'd have to have a really good GM that would really work with you on that if you're playing a more subtle character. Yeah, but overall, yeah. I absolutely adored this game. Well, so I'm curious, what in the game like puts some kind of constraints on these characters? Like, what prevents it from just being like an all powerful sort of god vest? Like, what are the enemies? What are the what are the challenges? I guess. So you have your other gods that you're like struggling against, right? They have their little god powers and their witches, and um, but like it's an OSR game. So it's a lot of dice rolling, and it's a lot of this encounter could go really smoothly, or it could go really terribly. So we were up against like a minion horde of 24 soldiers, and then there were these three like giant skeleton dudes that were actually made up of other people, like just a bunch of people's skeletons, and that was sort of terrible, but there they were. They were just monster-type things. And then there was a sorceress, too. And we were rolling like crap. It took us, like, an, like I don't know, 45 minutes to get through that battle, and our GM was rolling <laughs> really, really well. We rolled like crap. So, it's you know, that's kind of luck of the draw with a lot of OSR games. It's really hard to prepare for that, but from what I understand, you just throw really big minion hordes at them, you know, like Exalted. Okay. Or you have, like, he was telling us the stats of this witch queen we were trying to assassinate. And, yeah, she was she was quite a bit scarier than we were. Quite a bit. I think even <laughs> the four of us, because, of course, we're level zero. Uh, the four of us against her would have gotten our butts kicked. <laughs> level zero gods. I love yeah, it. level <laughs> zero gods. We're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> So it's it's it definitely cool. a cool concept for a game. I love Scion. It's my favorite one of my favorite settings without a good rule system from White Wolf. And I so I love that idea of of low level gods uh, trying to kick ass. Yeah, it was pretty cool. And obviously, if you're playing like campaign play, you might be a little more subtle than we were. Maybe a little. But... Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you're it's a one shot. So yeah, exactly. Go you it, just right? go it's in like and blaze of yeah. glory. I did get to give the speech of um, if all your like to the little soldier minions. I'm like, if all you're seeking is a glorious death, I can provide you that. Come join us, <laughs> nice, nice. which is my favorite speech ever to give. Awesome, cool. Uh, so thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs, thumbs up. up, two thumbs up. I'm cool. definitely it. There's two versions of it. There's one that's free and one that's not free. And I need to contact our GM and find out what the difference is because. I mean, if I can just get away with playing with the free version, I totally will because I'm cheap. But if the paid version, the free version is the game. Yeah. The the one that is for pay has art and I think nicer layout. Oh. So. Things yeah, that I like think, my roommate um, who actually yeah, does that might care about, but Andrea who yeah. just cares cares if words are spelled right, maybe not so much. <laughs> They're usually spelled right when. Um, God, it's important. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely <laughs> I'm definitely looking at picking that game up. Yeah, awesome. it's the same cool. nominee game. I've I've liked a lot of the stuff that he's put out. It's it's really tight. Sweet. Is there anything else you want to say about Godbound? Nope. Let me say that the Dungeon World and Apocalypse World sale goes on until September thirtieth, so it'll still be live as people are listening to this if they if they have it set to download right away, which means you should be subscribed. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Awesome. Lowell, how'd the sprawl go for you? Uh, so this is the first of two sessions, uh, part of the, the Gauntlet Midday Hangouts, and two sessions of the Sprawl, which I, I know you've run and we've talked about before on the podcast. We're using Roll20, and actually that really works well. There's a beautiful c character sheet that's set up for it that looks awesome, and the actual the map thing, being able to put the, the different tracks just on the map page works really well. I, I really like that. It was a great group of players. And I enjoyed it. The thing that hit me when I played it is this was a completely different game than I had in my head when I read the rules. Oh, really? <laughs> I read the PDF okay. and I loved it. 
And I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I, I, I really like this. You know, I, I can see what's, what's happening here. I, I bought the hardcover. I, I listened to you talk about it. And when we got to play, I was like, okay, this is ha- happening a little bit different than I thought. And boy, there's a lot more rules in this game than I had realized and a lot more details and a lot more things that are going on. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but I, I went back to the rules and, oh, yeah, that the game we played is the game that's written. But in my head, I had this whole very much abstracted mission phase, like it would be done very quick with like one or two rolls per oh, person. You would kind of do a round table. Oh, no. No, it's blow it's by blow, not, room by yeah. room. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I am laying on the ground yeah, blow at by the blow. end of this yeah, first session, yeah. bleeding out of my leg, and we've gotten in the first freaking room. Um, and I, I, it was really weird. I mean, it was super weird to have that disconnect between the game I had imagined in my head from the rules and what it actually is. And I, I don't know. It must have been some weird wishful thinking, but, but my wife, Sherry read it too, and she had the same impression. <laughs> so I think, I think just the way that we play at home may have bled over into that. Um, I, I like it. I like the sprawl. I, I, I I think there's a lot of potential there and I'm looking forward to this next session, but, but wow, that was very weird. Very, very weird. Huh? Yeah. See, when I read it, I, I didn't have that impression. I thought, okay, there's, you're going to spend about half the session, you know, doing your research and making your plan for what's going to happen on the mission. And then you're going to spend the other half of the session doing the mission. And yeah, like I, you know, abstraction is like one of the great powers of powered by the apocalypse like that that ability to like sort of summarize and, and abstract is really really effective in a lot of pbta games you're right though uh, the sprawl which is kind of we should mention is a mission-based cyberpunk pbta game i'm sure our listeners know that um it's not <laughs> like it's really not like it's 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 pretty yeah it's like blow by blow it's like okay we're at the base of the corporate building and now we're in the lobby and now we're in the elevator and now we're in the you know we're in the extraction point you know like you're doing every little step well, and several people who had played it during the session said that they'd never seen a mission done in one session, um, and especially not with character creation at the beginning, which when they said that, I was like, really? Yeah, uh, not with character creation for sure. But once you get that out of the way, you can do about a mission in a session. Okay. When we played, we did – it took us two sessions to finish the first mission because we had the character creation. But then we had three more sessions, which were a mission each. But yeah, yeah. it's it's definitely like – it's it, it's it feels a little bit like, you know – it feels a little bit like Dungeon World, honestly. I mean, like, you know, it's got the feel well, of that. And it's weird because like, I didn't ways. get that impression when I read Headspace. I, I could tell right away that Headspace was a blow by blow. You know, there's a lot of details and things there. I don't know what it was about this that, that gave me that weird illusion. But I, I'm looking forward to playing this uh, second session this week. Cool, cool. Yeah, Sprawl's great. Quick plug for Codex, um, the next issue of Codex, which is called Chrome, it has a little a little thing for the Sprawl awesome. in it. So fans of the Sprawl will want to look for that. Uh, you have to look for our Patreon to get that, uh, which is coming when, Rich? Soon. I don't know. Hopefully at the end of this month. Uh, is there anything else you want to say about the Sprawl, Lol? Nope. All right, cool. Uh, Andrea, I don't, I'm not going to even try to pronounce the name of this game, so just tell us what it is. <laughs> uh, we're, we're pronouncing it Simbarum. Simbarum. I don't know. Okay. It's it's Swedish, I think. And okay. So it's uh, it's more complicated it. than English, and by English I mean American. So <laughs> Simbarum is it's another one of those really dark settings because I love those. It's a fantasy world. Uh, the main kind of premise is the humans' kingdom has been destroyed, and they were all forced to flee and resettle. Which is kind of cool, because you're not playing in this castle that's 100 years old or 500 years old. You're playing in a castle that's like 10 years old. And the town around it is like 10 years old. And you have all these refugees that are just trying to make it day by day. And no one's getting along because, you know, humans invaded. And they're trying to settle their territory. And they're coming up against barbarian tribes. They're coming up against the denizens of the forest, like the elves. And nobody likes the elves. Apparently they're NPCs and no one's allowed to play them. And, you know, there's ogres and there's changelings. And it's it's this really dark, conflict-ridden world. And one of the things I really like about it, which is the exact opposite of Godbound, is, like, you are so tiny and minuscule. Like, you're just kind of buzzing (laughs) around. You're a little gnat. And there are all these huge political plots and all these huge organizations and everyone's got their own agenda 
And, you know, you're, you're lucky if you've been included in an agenda and you know about it because you probably don't. Someone's probably using you as a pawn. So I kind of really dug that. And I'm really looking forward to kind of clawing my way up the political ladder and actually getting to make a difference in the world. That's going to be really fun. Um, but it also really makes the world kind of that play to find out, like the apocalypse engine thing, because I have no idea what's going to happen. Like, there's just too many puzzle pieces to play with and too many pieces on the board. Um, the other, like, really cool thing about the game is every character has an aura. And if you are a barbarian, if you're uncivilized, your aura is very nature driven. Like, we have one character who his aura is the sun shining through the leaves of the trees. Hmm. And then if you're civilized, you have a very, you know, like a metal aura, like, you know, the spark off of hot metal or like mine is, um, it's actually polished brass that is actually reflective. So you can actually see my characters, the state of my character's soul in her aura. So as she gains corruption, because it's one of those fun games where magic users get corruption. So as she gains corruption, it like the aura itself will still be that beautiful, beautiful polished brass, but you'll see her reflection in it, like slowly transforming into something awful Mm -hmm. that's cool yeah very little little oscar wilde there little dorian gray yeah i I kind of love that tiny little story nugget the one problem i'm having with it like it's a very simple system like it's very osr you have your attributes everything's rolled with attributes you don't have skills but you have abilities and abilities are kind of like feats like there are all these different abilities all these different levels and I think every ability has three levels, and some of them are very straightforward. Like, congratulations, you are a novice. You can cast basic spells. Congratulations, you're advanced. You can cast advanced spells. And then some of them are like, well, you're a novice. You know everything about artifacts. Oh, now you're advanced, and now you know these specific languages, but not these languages. And if you want to try to learn these languages, you have to roll dice. And it's this weird crunch kind of in the middle of this otherwise very easy, very fluid system. I'm sure once we get used to it, it'll be fine, but... Yeah, yeah. It sounds like one of those situations where, like, it just takes a little bit of mastery. Yeah, our GM actually printed out everyone's abilities on little, like, cards and put them in little card sleeves. Mm -hmm. So we could just easily reference them because there's just that much stuff on them. (laughs) Neat. (laughs) That's cool. Yeah. I like when GMs go the extra mile in my face to face games. I'm not saying I go the extra mile, but I did. I would always, um, uh, I laminated all of my play aids and play sheets. Um, mm-hmm. so everyone had like a nice little laminated play sheet and they had a erasable nice. pencil that they could like mark them with. And I don't know, just handy. That's awesome. I'm so accustomed to online play and I'm so accustomed to like this, like this fast sort of churn of gaming that we do now, you know, it's like, okay, game, 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 game. And it's all just like, it's all online. It's great. It's awesome. But it's all a little ephemeral. It's, it's nice to have like these little, like, you know, to go back to the old days when the GM did like lots of little things like that, you know, like prepping things, but sorry, I'm just getting GM nostalgic because I used to do that kind of stuff all the time. (laughs) That's okay. Andrea and I play very long campaigns, so we're kind of rolling our eyes a little bit here since uh, yeah. since our stuff lasts for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not. Yeah, that's. Uh, but not everybody does cool little aids like that, so. Yes, exactly. There yeah. You go. <laughs> Somebody was like just complaining the other day. They were like, I really want to do like these these one shots and five session things are great, but I want to do something that's like 40 sessions long on Gauntlet <sighs> Hangouts. And I was like. <laughs> I hope you're ready to run it. <laughs> I hope you're ready to dive in there and do it because I won't be doing it. That's like um, three years. Yeah. 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 Like, if you're just, playing every other week anyway. I kind of, I don't know. Like, I mean, maybe you guys will think differently, but to me it just seems like I, I have a hard time staying in love with a story that long, you know, like that's my problem. Like I just, I can't fall in love with a story that where I want to revisit it for like a year. Like I just, I don't know. I'm, I just don't I yeah. have a hard time with that. <laughs> My boyfriend's groups do seasons. So like they have like Firefly and they're in season three of Firefly. And, you know, it's like a legacy game where they're playing their original characters, kids or relations oh, or cool. that's good. apprentices. Yeah, that's, and yeah, so they yeah. do that kind of thing. And I think that's really cool. And I could totally get behind that. But mm-hmm. 40 I mean, seems I have, like a lot. I have a living campaign thing going with Dungeon World and Rich does the Gauntlet City Limits thing, which I guess is kind of in the same spirit. Like it's not a, it's not like a one game campaign, but it's, you know, with all the same characters, but it's kind of like, there's a long-term cohesive thing going on. So yeah, I get that. Yeah. When I've run long-term 
online games, uh, 13th Age, Mutants and Masterminds. Uh, it, I've broken that up into arcs because I think you have to because the attention span is a little bit different there than face-to-face. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, do you have anything else you want to say about Simbarum? No, thank you. All right. Okay, Rich, so you finished up five sessions of Uncharted Worlds. How'd it go? It went pretty well. This was the game that Larry from Tabletop Super Highway so graciously DM'd for me and a couple of buddies. As a reminder, Uncharted Worlds is a, a space roaming sci-fi RPG that uses the Apocalypse Engine. Uh, it's a very broad scope. The goals are to be able to handle a game of from Mass Effect to possibly Battlestar Galactica to Earth One. I mean, really anything that is spacefaring or colony based space stations, Deep Space Nine, it wants to do all of those things. After the five sessions, I have some thoughts. So, just want to talk a little bit about so you guys have a bit of context. We had three characters. We had one person who was the captain of a ship. My character was the engineer. And then my buddy Norwood played the basically the science officer of the ship. And we were g- going on missions, and it was a rundown space station that we were involved in. So it, the, mentioning DS9 is kind of on purpose. That is probably the easiest touchstone for someone. And over five sessions... Uh, of two hour time sessions, uh, we found some technology, found out it's AI that you can embed into someone like cyberware, but it's somewhat sentient and really, really powerful. The science officer decided to implant it in himself. Some people died. He'd implanted them. So instead of handing off the tech like we were supposed to, our science officer basically stole a lot of it, and then we had to run from all the awesome factions that we created as part of character creation and world creation because they all wanted the really cool stuff. Uh, that was the story that we told in the five sessions. There are a lot of things that I, I really enjoy about Uncharted Worlds. The things that I highlight most is creating those factions was really fun, and the fact that those factions then came after sucked because I liked them a lot until then. We went with that space station. We were able to kind of influence how we wanted to interact with that, what kind of jobs we thought were most interesting. So that was fun. That That's that's a cool bit, right? That's the thing we enjoyed about Legacy Life Among the Ruins. We also like it in Uncharted Worlds. I mentioned this in a previous episode, but just to reiterate, Cramped Quarters is probably my favorite move. I love moves like that. Yeah, that's, that's mm-hmm. it. It's basically like a social move, right? Like where you kind of it decompress is. and it stuff. It is. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have to be, but it generally, we used it for whenever we had to go on long bits. Like, you got to go out to this thing. Okay. Who's the person you want to do cramp quarters with? And it's risky. I love because you're about to roll some dice. So it's like, oh, I'm interested so, in learning so more about So, what is cramped quarters for those of us who are not initiated? Thank you, Andrea, for asking. So, cramp quarters is a move where you. You say, okay, over this period of time in cramped quarters, I'm going to interface with this player character and or non-player character. You roll some dice and you have your your standard PBTA thing. And if you fail, you can actually harm like you got on their nerves. Uh, it's, you're putting it at risk. But if it's seven to nine, you're going to find out a few details, but then they're going to ask a hard question of you. You're going to have to reveal a little bit about your characters. You guys got to know each other. And you can actually influence or improve the relationship with a 10 plus and also get to know some information. So it's a neat getting to know you bit that I enjoyed and, and led to a lot of role play and deepening relationships within the ship crew that I liked a lot. Um, so that that's, that's a hot little move and uh, one of my favorite bits. Other part that I mentioned that, again, we got to see more and more, uh, and it deepened, is that experience points is across the group. So oh. an advancement. Yeah, yeah. And what's cool is that that advancement is a plot point within the story. So as an engineer, I'll have a few careers. There's no one playbook. You actually are kind of piecing together three playbooks. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. You can probably guess where I'm going to go with that one because <laughs> you know me. Um, so, But you have an advancement that could be a thing breaks, a critical thing breaks. And if that happens within your story, 
thing, everybody takes an advancement. Advancement is XP. So it's it's called an advancement, which is a little confusing because I'm thinking PBTA and advancement is what you get after 5 XP. But in this one, an advancement is an, an XP. Everyone gets it. You know, you got a deal that goes sour. Everybody gets an advancement. And so you can have three or four. It's almost like a group key, which I love. Yeah, it's pretty and, cool. Yeah. yeah. And, and what's cool is you can you can swap them out. So you're like, oh, I'm a little tired of stuff breaking all the time. I'd like to get advancements from this other potential thing that's happening. So that's really hot, and I, I think it's great because it gives us a lot of involvement. It's almost that getting an XP for a fail in Dungeon World. It's like, okay, this crappy thing happened, but we all know we get an advancement for this thing. And we're flagging to the GM, this is a thing that I don't mind if you introduce. There will be no heartburn. We've got it right here on our sheet. You want to screw me in this way? This is the way to screw me with no, you don't have to give me any salve for the wound. It's all good. Uh, so the, there's just some things about Uncharted Worlds that I think are really hot. Things that I didn't love, and I mentioned this before, but just deepening the play it has come more and more to be a thing that's just not super for me. One of the things I love about Apocalypse World is that 7 to 9, right? When the 7 to 9 happens, I'm a huge fan of choose from a list. The whole 7 to 9, you get to choose two things, and that third thing you don't choose really sucks because you wanted it so bad or you did not want to risk it but you want the other two things more or you only get one from the list and those two you know are going to hose you but if you got to just grab onto the edge of the cliff and hold on this is what you want to save I love that I love it as a player because it puts things in my hands it gives me an opportunity to shape the narrative and similar to advancement I know what I'm not having to give up that isn't really part of Uncharted Worlds. Uncharted Worlds is on a 7 to 9, almost all the basic moves. I, I can't think of one off the top of my head where there is any kind of choice for the player. 7 to huh. 9 is, Oof. GM's going to give you a hard choice. Hmm. Okay. So it's like it's it's like the Defy Danger result, Yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah. You'd love it. It's like World of Dungeons. It's like World of Dungeons all the time. <laughs> it's nothing but just like GM says, GM says, GM says. And 10 is, you got most of it. You got most of it. You got most of it. So, yeah, I, I don't love that. That's not a thing that I want. When I go into PBTA, I don't want a thing where if I succeed, it's up to the GM. I want to be part of that decision. Like, are, is it sometimes like where the GM gives you a choice? Because World of Dungeons, you, like, you, you, yeah. you can give the players a choice. Like, I say this or that, and then you choose between those two. Like, it's you're kind of just... Absolutely, yes. Yeah. It, it most definitely well, says like, GM can give you a hard there. choice. They're not like you can choose from these things. Like it's like, correct. The There's no, okay. I don't know what the hard choice is going to be, Got it. which is very flexible. And I understand that logic, especially for such a wide spanning scope. Uh, that is the goal of this game is really hard to ratchet in those three choices. I would think, right? Because the three choices would be different tonally yeah, in a Battlestar yeah. Galactica game than it would be in a star Wars game. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I can't disagree with the logic that motivated that choice. That said, as a player, I was disappointed that I didn't. Hmm. I'd like, like that cookie. I just do. So that I'll, I'll kind of circle back to the three careers. So you have an origin, and then you have a first career, and you have a second career. It's a life path system. And that's cool if you don't want just a generic playbook, right? It allows you to have lots of interesting custom builds. I didn't necessarily have a problem with that at all, because once you've done that, you don't necessarily swap around careers. That said, and this is playing from the PDF, but playing from the PDF, the moves are nestled within those careers. And some of the moves are very similar. So if you've got move from career criminal, it might be slightly different from career outcast. So you need to actually keep your, your mind's eye on those, which is not necessarily that bad if you're not gaining advancements. But if you have an advancement, you got to look at three different careers now. Right. You got to look at all yeah. those moves. Yeah. And it's like, oh, a lot of, you know, jazz. if I were at a table printing those out, because one of the things I think I like about Uncharted Worlds from a, a layout perspective is that those moves are actually blocks of text that could easily be printed out and thrown onto cards. And that'd be kind of cool. You know, I could just like hole punch those suckers and that'd be a neat little way to carry around my characters, these little ring of, of moves. 
But from a, a viewing a PDF and having to jump around to this is on page 110, this is on page 80, this is on page 94, I did not love that. Yeah, yeah a lot. Yeah. There was one point where you've got a number of basic moves. There's like nine, and I wanted to do a, what felt like a, like an in fiction thing, but there was never a move that like fit it. I just wanted to basically fake so this tech that we were supposed to hand off to the person who by the way it turned out has been killed and so now we're on the run from a bunch of factions we wanted to basically make some fake versions of it and hand it off to one faction and then try to run away but we could dump it off to the other faction if we failed that was our plan it really wasn't like we couldn't find a move and i'm sure someone listening who is more experienced with uncharted worlds or smarter than me will say oh idiot you should have done this we basically just larry said use patch up and we'll just do that because there was no generic, there's no defy danger. There's oh, no easy. Hmm. Yeah. I guess Larry could have done a custom move, right? I mean. He could have, but there's like 45 in the book. Surely one of them will cover <laughs> it. would have worked, yeah. <laughs> it seems a shame you couldn't find the one that worked, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, So in summary, to kind of come back, Uncharted Worlds is the only game that does what it's trying to do. I think Star Wars World is pretty cool, but there are too many Jedi. So I'd rather play Uncharted Worlds. Um, there are too many Jedi playbooks. Hmm. I'm just saying it. You know, that's it's not my jam. Um, love it, but it's not my jam. And Uncharted Worlds, it's very Mass Effecty, and I I could have fun with it. I feel like it's like our five sessions. If they were a prequel, and we kind of rolled into, okay, this is what we really want to play. Now we know what the system does. Now it serves us. But at this point, I'm like a little stuck. Like our factions are really way better than us and we mostly suck and that's hard to like mm. so so it's it's been a it's been an interesting five uh sessions we're gonna walk away from it for a bit like we're gonna put it to bed and we may circle back around to it later after we have some ch- some time to digest do you think a game like this should have more of a fictional focus do you think it being so so wide open to all sorts of different types of sci-fi type stories do you think that's a do you think there's a strength or a hindrance? For me, it's a hindrance. For me, I want an opinion. I want the game master to not give me this kind of vanilla, make it what you want thing. I love it when there's a focus and there's a drive. Like here is the thrust. I want to be able to, I want you to be able to play these kinds of stories or this is the, this is what, where I see things. You shape it where you want, make it whatever apocalypse you want. But here's the thing is about scarcity, right? You can play whatever superhero character you want, but the thing is your, it's about your labels changing. Your opinions are influenced by others. You can play whatever teenage monster you want, but you don't have the ability to easily read somebody because that's not what the teenage experience is about. All those have a point of view. Right. Uncharted yeah. Worlds doesn't have a point of view. It's not trying to force me towards something. And so I got to bring a lot to the table. And there are people who love generic systems. They love GURPS. They love Savage Worlds. They love Fate. They love Fate Accelerated because they can bring that, that thrust to it. And if I were that inspired and I had that kind of time, I could probably grow to love it. But I'd much rather have something that's got a chassis and really want I want to drive it somewhere. I think Worlds in Peril suffers from the same problem in terms of a superhero game. I, there's a lot of love there, but it is so generic. Um, it doesn't take a kind of a, a fictional angle, and I think that's a weakness to it. I haven't played that one yet. I've, I've, been, like, I've been meaning to get it to the table at some point, though, just because I don't know. Like it, it, it to, in my mind at least, like it seems more of like an action focused yes. comic book thing and i think that's maybe more appealing to me i don't know i think i don't know i'm just saying i'll have to I run it mean it but yeah. i'd like to try it at some yeah we should try it at some point uh rich you said having uh moves on cards it just occurred to me you know it'd be fun is do a one shot where you have a bunch of basic moves and then everybody for their characters drafts moves from cards <laughs> you know, you put like six out there. There are three players. Each one picks one. And you throw the other three away, and they they make their character from a bunch of moves like that. It'd be goofy. That'd be kind of crazy. With great power, actually, does something like that. I really love the character creation system in that. Uh, yeah. Uh, Rich, is there anything else we want to say about Uncharted Worlds? 
No, no. Thanks. Thanks for giving me a chance to chat about it. No, no. I was I was really anxious to hear your thoughts after having played like, you know, five sessions. I consider five sessions to be a good long a good long sample. It's of like the, the length of your interest in yeah, anything, exactly I think. Right. <laughs> okay, we'll still wrap up. Yesterday the Story Game Sunday crowd played The Final Voyage of the Celine. This is a game by James Mullen, who wrote uh, The Hood, who I think you had on Plus One Forward a while back, right, Rich? Yeah, he was. He was on for The Hood. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> James Mullen, who wrote The Hood. He joined us for the game, which was, which was great. Uh, so he was with us playing with Story Game Sunday regulars. The Final Voyage of the Celine is a hack of, or at least it was inspired, I gather, by another game we've talked about a fair amount, Witch, The Road to Lindisfarne. And in it, you are these people that are on this ship. It's in the far future. It's a sci-fi thing. And this ship is traveling to Earth. And along the way, the ship starts to like break down. And by the end, uh, the ship is destroyed. And what we're doing is we're telling the story of these characters like throughout the course of this journey. Like which it has pre-generated characters or like characters that are already, you know, already named and they have like, you know, some basics that you know about them. They come with some questions though, and you have to answer some questions. Answering these questions kind of lets you put like a more personalization onto the character, I guess, kind of put your own spin on it. And then uh, they also have an agenda that they get. And the agenda is randomly distributed with cards between the characters. Uh, and the agendas are linked up with another character. So like throughout the course of the game, for example, my character's agenda was I was trying to convert another character to my faith. Another person's agenda was trying to uncover this other character's like criminal activity or something like that. So throughout the course of the game, your scenes are, you're kind of like, you're basically playing your character in the spirit of like, you know, the answers to your questions that you use to set them up and also trying to accomplish your agenda even though like <laughs> accomplishing the agenda doesn't mean too much because by the end the ship is going to be destroyed. It's just a it's just a reason to role play basically. It's set up so that just like which it's highly structured and it has predetermined like things that happen during each collection of scenes which are which are like I think there's like three different acts and then kind of like a like an epilogue thing. The first act is it's like it's called the social act, and we see the characters just kind of interacting with each other and making sort of subtle overtures to their agenda, trying to like work on their agenda with the other characters. The next set of scenes is called they're like the mystery scenes, uh, where you introduce like something mysterious or you discover something, or there's just something like that's kind of in the environment that like is that needs to be explored in some way, or you stumble onto something that was hidden, right? your scenes have to have a focus like that. And so as you're playing, like you, you know a little bit about the characters, you know about their motivations. And then as you play, you also start to reveal like some mysteries and secrets, which, which kind of portend like the fate of, of the Celine, Right. And then the final set of scenes is called the conflict act and the conflict act. It's just, you're kind of barreling toward the conclusion at that point. The Celine is falling apart at that point. Uh, and you're kind of doing your best to, you're either abandoning your agenda or you're, or you're desperately trying to complete your agenda. But in any case, we're watching the ship, uh, fall apart and, or, or it's careening towards its like final destruction. And, uh, that's kind of where we see the characters at that point. And then at the end, I don't want to ruin it because it's, I think it's supposed to be kind of like a secret, but basically at the end, uh, there's a procedure by which you determine like who lives and who dies. And then that also has an effect on the epilogues. Um, I really liked it. I'm a big fan of which the road to Lindisfarne. This game is, even though it's in the text, it says it's like a hack of it. It's pretty different. Um, <laughs> they, there's like a fair amount of difference between them. But they, you know, but their similarities are, are apparent, mostly in the structure, uh, which is one of the things I like about Witch. A lot of story games I feel like are sometimes a little too loose and a little too open, and you have kind of like a getting going problem. But you definitely mm-hmm. don't have an issue like that in this game. This game is highly structured, leads to a very, very coherent story, and uh, and I quite liked it. The only thing I I wonder about is if it will have the same problem as Witch does. I think, which is. I've played Witch several times now, and the story's always kind of the same. 
I don't know. And I've played with different groups of people, but the story always kind of has like a samey feel to it to the point where they actually release like a whole different set of characters for which I think just to kind of mix it up for people. And James did the same with this game. This game has a whole extra set of characters that you can use, uh, which I think is That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And you get that as part of the, uh, the purchase prize. But, you know, the one the one game we played of it, I really liked it. I mean, the story was really solid, really, really cohesive. The RP, everybody was really on point on the RP yesterday. That's that's not anything to do with the game, but um, it was just really, I mean, the game helped us, I guess, you know, encouraged us to RP that way. So that's a thing. I really dug it. It doesn't overstay its welcome. I mean, we were in and out uh, with character creation and everything in like three hours. So that was awesome. Yeah, it was just really good. The only thing we didn't really get to do each of the characters has this thing called an authority move. And this is not something that exists in Witch. This is something unique to this game. But the idea behind the authority move is each of the characters has a thing that as a player, you can say, okay, this happens in the story and no one can contradict you. So I think one of them is like, I put a character in an airlock. Like that's a thing that you, that character can do and no one can object. Right. Or I, um, I discover a new scientific phenomenon. Like, I do that. It's a thing. You can't stop me. We didn't use them. And we talked with James about that at the end. We were like, well, should we have, like, like I was aware of it. Like, I knew it was there, but we just never used them. And he says that in his games he's played of it, that his groups, they did use it. I don't think we used it mostly because we're a pretty good group together and we were kind of you know, we're all about like, oh yeah, that's cool. That sounds awesome. Do that, right? Like we don't need like a thing that says, oh, I need to trump the story right now. <laughs> you know, like we, that's just not how we play, mm. right? And so I think that's why right. the authority moves never came into play for us. But we all acknowledge they were there. And we, you know, like for my character, it was a thing I knew I could use if I felt the need, but we didn't need it. The story was great without it. Anyway, the final voyage of the Celine, I, re- I really liked it. I think I don't remember how much it is on drive through, but um, it's worth picking up. It was really cool. Awesome. Sounds cool. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty awesome. Uh, you know, just a real straightforward, kind of stru- highly structured story game. Good stuff. Uh, that's all I got. So let's move on to giving me life. Hey, it's giving me life. Rich, what's giving you life? What is giving me life? I started to go with Farscape, but I'm going to go. I'm, I'm doing it, even though it's not coming right now. The prep for it is giving me life. In 2017, the Sunday group, the Intercontinental Group of Awesome, and Andrea has been very helpful in these conversations. I have this thing I want to do, partially inspired by the fun I've had with Gauntlet City Limits. But I'm, for lack of a better term at this time, I'm stealing from Arnold Cassell's idea of the saga series and what it will be is we're going to choose a a series of RPGs that we're all interested in, and we're going to lace it together into one ongoing campaign. Uh, The current working idea I have for it is that we're going to use the connection point of SIG, the city between, which is from Jason Pitt, uh, Genesis of Legend. It's basically Planescape with the serial numbers filed off. Right. And... (laughs) Then when they go out of SIG to the other planes of existence, they'll reinterpret their characters in the game system of that kind of home world. And so we get to try lots of different games, right? In our little, we only do, we only have the attention span for five games at a time, but they all (laughs) contribute to one overarching story. And that's so I don't have to give up on that campaign joy that I get (laughs) that I I haven't scratched that itch in a long time. So I'm pretty excited about the saga series. I got to be honest with you. A lot lot of plain, a lot of planescape inspired stuff happening lately. Seems to be be a thing. Yeah. It's having a moment. Uh, discern realities is doing a little planescape thing. I know. I love it. This I'm I'm excited. I think it's going to be here. Uh, Andrea, what's giving you life? It's fall. I have the cold to prove it. Um, I love fall. It's because I'm from Minnesota and weather's a big deal here. So fall is like perfect for just cuddling under blankets and drinking hot chocolate or warm apple cider and nursing terrible head colds, I guess. (laughs) That doesn't sound like a giving me life. (laughs) I know. I'm really excited for fall. I love fall. It's just like the cold is blunting it. (laughs) <laughs> this is where we each talk about something not necessarily related to RPGs that is lately inspiring us or filling us with joy, not snot. <laughs> but, um, and th- there, there's no mention of snot on that 
directions. <laughs> okay. No, I, was, I, it was I, do, I love fall. Fall I love is fall my too, favorite yeah. season. My, my partner and I, um, you know, we're from Texas and in Texas you don't get, uh, there's no such thing as fall, right? Like it just goes, the trees go from green to dead. Like that's it. And so we're really into like, fall as a marketing concept you know they're really into like you know all that you know like so we go like so we were just at pottery barn buying like glass pumpkins and shit you know to like put around the house (laughs) that is that is fantastic we want like the look of fall right uh in texas you 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 appreciate the look of fall because you don't get real fall awesome lol let's give you live Last week, I got three new uh, Japanese RPGs, JRPGs, the revision of Dragon Quest Seven on the 3DS. But then also my wife, for our 20th anniversary, she wanted a Wii U. Uh, we bought one of those and we got two weird JRPGs. Uh, one of them, the Xenoblade Chronicles, that is this massive open world walk wherever you want. Here's exactly what you're doing, but the system is super opaque. But the other game we got is called... Tokyo Mirage Sessions FE. <laughs> and so it's a hybrid of Fire Emblem and uh, the Shin Megami Tensei series. And you're playing idol singers and you fight with music. And when you go into the battle mode, there's a giant stadium and there are pictures of you in the <laughs> idol costumes and you're, you're summoning per- performas and it's freaking crazy. It's the most over the top fashionista thing. My wife, her eyes got huge when she saw it and she goes, Oh my God, I love this so much. <laughs> um, and it is, it is, it is the most whacked out game I've ever seen. And I love it. It's, it's crazy, crazy over the top. Awesome. The thing giving me life that uh, I'm super excited about my giving me life. Okay. So every year I do like a special game thing for halloween okay like every year since we since i've started doing the gauntlet i've done like a gimmicky halloween game thing and i finally settled on what this year's is going to be we're going to tell over the course of the whole weekend we're going to basically create an entire six-part slasher flick movie we're going to tell the stories of all six movies and here's how it's going to work on friday we're going to play the final girl and we're going to play the, the name of the movie is Dia de los Muertos, okay? It's about a bunch of college kids. The semester's over, and they're going to have a bitchin' fiesta party, uh, but there's a killer, okay? The killer's name is Porkface. That's the that's the Dia de los Muertos. On Saturday, we're going to do another game of Final Girl, Dia de los Muertos 2, The Revenge of Porkface. And then Sunday is going to be Cheat Your Own Adventure, where we will play three games of Cheat Your Own Adventure, which will be parts three, four, and five. Uh, part three is Dia de los Muertos, uh, Night of the Bruja. It has nothing to do with the Porkface saga. Huh. It's when they, it's when they thought it was going to be an anthology series. And it's about, it's about, a, it's about a young woman who goes to a school for gifted young women that turns out to be a satanic cult. Uh, Part four, Dia de los Muertos four, is when we go back to the Porkface saga. It's going to be about a little psychic boy who's trying to explore his connection to Porkface. And then uh, part five is Dia de los Muertos part five, Noche de Terror. And Noche de Terror is about a screenwriter who is going to be writing a script for the next installment of Dia de los Muertos. But the script comes alive, right? And then finally, on on Halloween Day, we're going to play another game of the Final Girl for Dia de los Muertos 6, Alien vs. Porkface. It's going to oh. be so good. <laughs> so, I, I love is, how much thought you've that, put into this. Yeah. It's epic. That is right. awesome. It's going to be epic. I, I love the Suspiria reference there with three. That's that's. That's re- that's brilliant. <laughs> did, oh, did you get this? I'm glad you got the Suspiria reference. I didn't know if anybody would. I was like, oh, good, yeah, good. It's good. It's good. Little. I I'm really excited about it. The, the sessions are going up uh, as of the day of this recording. I've got two of them up. The other two sessions will go up uh, shortly, and they sh- they'll all be up by the time this episode yes. goes up. So yeah, they'll all be filled by the time this episode comes out. Let's be honest. <laughs> I know probably, but <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. If, but but you don't have to go to all four sessions. You can go to any of them you want. But I'm going to record all of them. So that if anybody wants to watch us role play the, the Dia de los Muertos saga, it'll all be available. I think it's going to be super, super fun. I'm really excited about it. So yeah, it's giving me life. Awesome. And listeners, that's our show. 
Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, I recommend you go to our website, www.gauntlet-rpg.com. You'll find links to our G Plus community, our other podcasts, and our various meetups, including Gauntlet Hangouts, where I'll be running Dia de los Muertos, <laughs> a, a horror flick saga. We're also on Twitter at Gauntlet RPG. Andrea, where can we find you? Ivory Thorns on Google. Awesome. Lol. On Google, my name, and then I also Twitter at edige23, and I blog at Age of Ravens. Awesome. And Rich? O-R-K-L-O-R-D at the Twitter. Awesome. Andrea, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Lowell, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, why, thank you so much. <laughs> Rich, thank you for being on the show and, and no, doing all you do. thank you, Jason. <laughs> Listeners... Thank you, guys. Uh, Have a good one. When we came into that first session uh, of impressions... Hold on a second. I smacked this spit guard. Come on, you <laughs> piece of shit. It's okay. This is why it would be dangerous for me to have, like, a mic. This is so... This is so our stinger. I thought that was going to say the same thing. <laughs>